ladies and gentlemen. Today is a lovely cloudy day and I'm gonna jump right in with some primer while I tell you what we're gonna do today. As you may or may not know, I am currently a third year virology student at the University of Pretoria. And yesterday I wrote my virology semester test so I feel all educated and ready to talk about viruses. So for today's video, I thought I would answer some common questions about viruses and clear up some common misconceptions. Because there's no better time than a pandemic caused by a virus to make sure that everyone knows how a virus works. I am by no means a professional, as I mentioned, I'm still busy studying and I'm in my last year of studying and I do not know everything there is to know about viruses. Make sure to always do your own research, but I thought I would share with you what I know. For foundation, I just used my Allegro Pro Liquid Foundation and for concealer, I'm also going to be using the Allegro Pro Liquid Conceal. And I'm going to let it sit underneath my eyes for a bit because apparently that gives the concealer a higher coverage. So I'm going to do that while I blend it in everywhere else first. So a common question about viruses. Are viruses alive? And there isn't really an answer to that one. People are actively debating if viruses are alive or not. They have some of the properties of living organisms, but not some of the crucial ones. But I generally consider them to be non-living. What a bad question to start off with. Now, how do you kill a virus if a virus is not alive to begin with? Well, the answer to that question is that things like disinfectants and hand sanitizer and other such things don't actually attempt to kill the virus, but rather to neutralize the virus, meaning that it's made incapable of infecting you. It's easy to do this with membrane viruses, which are basically viruses with a little lipid bilayer around them, because it's easy to break that membrane, and without the membrane, the virus doesn't have the machinery it needs to be able to get into your cell. Technically, the virus can still be effective. If I were to take what's left of the virus after breaking the membrane and putting it in a cell, yeah, it will still infect the cell but it's no longer capable of getting in the cell itself and therefore it's no longer infective. The virus is having us all stay at home right now also has a membrane and that's why something like hand sanitizer works because something like alcohol works to just pop that membrane and then it can get to you. The next common question is how does a virus make you sick? Well, what a virus does is it gets into your cells and depending on the type of virus, it'll be a different type of cell. Some viruses prefer cells of the respiratory tract, some viruses prefer mucous membranes, etc, etc. But what they do is they get into their cell of choice and then they hijack the machinery your cell has. Because within your cell, you have a bunch of different protein and RNA molecules working to keep your cell alive. And amongst others, you have proteins and RNA molecules working to make more parts of your cell so that your cell can eventually replicate. And what a virus pretty much does is it comes in, it uses this machinery from the cell to replicate itself and then outcompetes your cell components. Meaning that there's basically a queue of viruses that want to be replicated before all the things you need your cell to replicate. And this can eventually lead to cell death because your cell doesn't get around to making the necessary things it has to make to stay alive. Some viruses do encode for their own enzymes that help them with replication, especially negative sense RNA viruses because they have to transcribe the RNA they have to the positive strand because the positive strand is the one that can be translated into protein products. And these protein products include things such as membrane proteins or capsid proteins. Now the reason you get sick if you have a viral infection is your cell doesn't work the way it should and it starts expressing viral proteins and then your immune system picks it up and goes, that's the one, we got to get rid of that. Your immune system also picks up the free virus particles in your bloodstream and attacks those too. Your body launches a pretty basic attack with something unknown like a new type of virus. That's why most viral diseases have pretty common symptoms like a fever and a runny nose. Can you get infected by the same virus more than once? The answer to that depends on what type of virus it is. Number one, your body produces memory cells that helps your body recognize the same virus if you're infected with it again and then launch an attack that worked last time to prevent you from getting sick from another infection. However, the memory cells produced by different viruses don't last equally as long. Some memory cells last a lifetime, some of them only two to three years. You being able to produce these memory cells is part of why vaccines work. 
And apparently there's a lot of confusion on the internet about how vaccines work. But basically vaccines contain either small bits of the virus itself after it had been treated to make sure the virus is neutralized and can no longer infect you, or just proteins that are found on the virus. Either way, this gives your body something to look out for and to produce memory cells for. So that when you get infected by the real deal, you won't get sick because instead of wasting time on figuring out what do I do with this virus? Your body knows what it is and immediately attacks it the right way and then prevents you from getting sick. So do some vaccines contain viruses? Yes, they do. But these viruses cannot make you sick. That's because once again, before putting the virus in the vaccine, we took away the ability of the virus to get into your cell. So even though it's in your bloodstream where your immune system can see it and form a response to it, it cannot get in your cell and thus cannot infect you. Some people wonder why you have to get a flu vaccine every single year. Well, this is because the flu virus changes a lot. On the surface of the flu virus, it has different H and N proteins and different combinations, which results in the virus looking different, so your body not recognizing it if it has a new combination. So every year you have to get a new vaccination for the new strain that is circulating. The hope is to eventually produce a vaccine that helps your body get itself immune to a part of the virus that does not change, but we're not quite there yet. I have mentioned this before, but the flu virus has been responsible for two pandemics in the last 50 years. Get some blush on that nose? Some people might wonder why are viruses so dangerous? Well, the answer to that is because we can't really do anything about them. Once you have a viral infection, your body has to take care of it itself. Unlike bacteria, where we can give you antibiotics that consist of molecules that interfere with the growth of the bacteria itself, we really have limited capabilities of interfering with viruses. Now you do get antiretrovirals and what these do are they interfere with the enzyme responsible for reverse transcription of the viral genome into your genome. And if you can stop that part, you can stop it from becoming a permanent infection. But your body still has to fight off the virus itself. A big part of this is if you were to interfere with the machinery responsible for the viral replication, you're interfering with the same machinery responsible for your cellular replication. And that could be deadly. Antiretrovirals work by targeting the machinery produced by the virus. The virus itself encodes the reverse transcriptase enzyme, and we do not have the same enzyme in our cells. That's why if you introduce a molecule into the body that prevents that enzyme from working, it'll stop the virus and not you. Some people think if you treat the symptoms of a viral disease, it'll make the disease last longer. And the answer to that is, no, that's not how it works. There has yet to be any proof that treating the symptoms of a disease makes the disease last longer. But I quickly want to go back to antibiotics and how they work. I told you they don't work on viruses. So you might be wondering why would a doctor give you antibiotics if you have a viral infection? Well, that is because your immune system is down while you are fighting off a viral infection. And that's when bacteria come in and cause secondary infection. And this is typically done by opportunistic bacteria that you have on you at all times. You have a wide variety of bacteria just chilling in your mouth, in the back of your throat, on your skin, in your intestines, everywhere. And if given the chance, this bacteria will take over and make you sick. That's what happens when someone has HIV or AIDS. HIV itself does not kill you, it just prevents your body from picking up that it is being infected by anything else. So common bacteria that your body can usually easily get rid of can come in and cause havoc and your body doesn't know it's there. So no one has ever died of HIV alone. And actually, our bodies produce a very strong and very effective response to HIV when you're infected with it, and the numbers of the virus in your system go down dramatically. However, because HIV is a retrovirus, it adds its genome to your genome, so every time your cell replicates, it replicates the virus within it as well. So once that has happened, it's impossible to get it out of your system, because the virus is literally encoded in your own DNA. And unfortunately, your body cannot forever go on fighting off this virus. And yes, HIV is also a pandemic. Now, some people might wonder, what does it mean to be a carrier of a virus? Well, being a carrier means you have the virus in you and you can give the virus to other people. However, you yourself are not sick or showing symptoms. And this is a problem because you don't know you're sick. So you don't know to prevent the spread of the virus. So you're going about your day la-di-la-di-da like nothing's wrong. 
Meanwhile, you're giving all your friends and co-workers this virus. You might also want to know how a virus spreads. And ultimately, for you to have a virus in your system, it has to get into your system. And depending on the virus, that can happen in different ways. Some viruses are capable of surviving air exposure and they can be transmitted through the air. And they usually get in the air through someone that's sick coughing and then small little droplets float off in the air carrying the virus and then you breathe it in and then you get sick. Some viruses are only found in bodily fluids. That could be like your defecation, your blood, of course, your breast milk, and to a much lesser extent, your saliva. And let's not forget your vomit. Now, to be infected with a virus like this, of which an example would be the Ebola virus, you have to actually touch the bodily fluid and get it into your system. So like, touch the fluid and like, rub it your eye, put it in your mouth, something like that. Then you don't have to wear a mask because it's not like you can breathe the virus in. Some viruses can survive on surfaces, so if someone that's sick touches a surface, gets the virus on it, you touch it next and then put your hand in your mouth or something, you can pick it up as well. The main route of entry is typically through the mouth, be it by breathing it in or by touching it and then touching your mouth. So it's typically a good idea to wash your hands a lot and not touch your mouth. There's actually a variety of non-viral diseases caused by self-inoculation. So basically, all the bacteria and stuff you touched in the business your body's trying to get rid of, you're now putting straight into your mouth and then you get sick from that. Which is why we wash our hands after we go to the bathroom. Another thing I'm sure you've heard a lot of now, but that might be confusing some of you, is the word reservoir. A reservoir is a species that has the virus in them, but the virus doesn't make them sick. So they're pretty much a species of carriers. And a very common reservoir species are bats. And that's because bats have a very unique immune system that I think is pretty cool that allows them to fend off a variety of pathogens. They've also been at this game of evolution a lot longer than we've been. But basically bats carry several different pathogens in them without getting sick from it. And it's only when a member from another species is exposed to the virus through the bats that a disease happens. And this is because this new species is not familiar with the disease and thus gets sick quite easily. You wouldn't be able to tell that the reservoir species has the virus in them because they don't show any symptoms of it. Reservoir species unfortunately allow many diseases to continue because we cannot get the disease out of the reservoir species. We do try though, we do try vaccination of wild animals, like with rabies, we put out food with the vaccination in it, hoping that wild animals will eat that and then they won't have rabies and carry it around to people and their pets. But generally staying away from the reservoir species means you can stay away from the disease. One of the last things I want to tell you about is the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic and the phrase global pandemic. An epidemic is a regional outbreak of a disease. Like if one town has an outbreak of the flu, that would be an epidemic. The most popular example, again, is the Ebola virus. Because it hit in a region in Africa, infected many people, but it wasn't worldwide. A pandemic, by definition, is worldwide. A pandemic is when there is a disease found all around the world. And considering how many countries are affected by the novel coronavirus, we are 100% in a pandemic right now. As I've mentioned, we've had pandemics before. We had the swine flu pandemic. We currently have the HIV pandemic because HIV is worldwide. And what that means is the phrase global pandemic is so redundant and it gets on my nerves because if you say global pandemic, it's so clear that you don't know what a pandemic is because if you knew that a pandemic means global, you wouldn't be saying global pandemic. But everyone is saying it because the news is saying it. It makes me want to cry. But it's just pandemic. I do want to tell you there is no preference for a virus between hosts. There are stigmas around this world that only certain colors or certain types of people get certain types of diseases. And that is quite frankly untrue. You are just as susceptible to a virus as the next person. And the color of your skin or the size of your bank account does not change that. It is true that being well off enables you to avoid diseases because instead of sharing a room with someone who's been exposed, you can go sit in your own mansion and keep yourself safe. 
but that doesn't mean you cannot be infected and that doesn't mean you can't get the disease. It is also true that people that are well off are less likely to die of a certain disease because they can afford the healthcare. So people that cannot afford that healthcare are more likely to die of the disease, but that doesn't make it a poor person's disease and it's a terrible mindset to have. But just because you have resources doesn't mean you're too good to get it. I wish we could remove stigmas around diseases so that people aren't afraid to get tested. It's unfortunate to see people, number one, die of something that could have been treated because they didn't want to admit they have it, and number two, spread it more because they didn't want to admit they have it. Especially like STDs, it shouldn't be an embarrassing thing to go get tested for one. You should go get tested and get good rid of it instead of sitting there suffering with it and giving it to other people. But we live in a stigmatized world. But that aside, let me spray some setting spray. Well, then that is it for today's video. I created this cozy pink look to match the cozy weather outside and I'm ready to get under a blanket, have some cocoa and watch a movie. I'm also in the process of baking cookies and I'm ready for them to get out of the oven. But I hope you learned something today and that I could answer some questions for you. If you have more, please drop them in the comments. I'd be happy to get back to you and to answer a few more for you. I'd also be happy to do the research for you. But then I hope you enjoyed today's video as much as I enjoyed making it. And I look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye!